Hello everyone, this is Paul the Oka Knight bringing you an overview of A Most Fearful Sacrifice, a Herman Lutman game published by Flying Pig Games. The Battle of Gettysburg. About every 10 years or so, the hobby is treated with a magnum opus treatment of the battle. And here we go all over again. A Most Fearful Sacrifice is a continuation of Lutman's blind sword system with several regimental ACW titles published through Revolution Games. While excellent, they boast a level of detail that is best applied to smaller battles, such as Pea Ridge, or parts of larger battles, such as Longstreet Attacks, Day 2 of Gettysburg. Any system, no matter how good, will eventually collapse if pressed beyond reasonable limits. Longstreet Attacks, while a great game on a neglected topic, also revealed the ragged edge of the existing system. Enter the Devils to Pay. The first day of Gettysburg where Lutman streamlined the system to where it could handle the big battles. And streamlined really is the right word. It is definitely not dumbed down. While a complete game in itself, the Devils to Pay actually gives the impression of having been a test bed for the updated system. Lutman all but acknowledges this in the designer's notes for A Most Fearful Sacrifice, and I believe made the right decision to release it as a complete standalone package rather than some sort of expansion package to The Devils to Pay. So let's take a look. The box is adorned with Confederate General Hood leading his Texans into the fight on the second day of the battle. It is sturdy and appears up to the challenge of keeping its precious contents safe. The shape is interesting, as it is broader and flatter than, say, the three-inch deep boxes GMT typically uses. It's a tweener. I'm not sure whether I want to store it vertical, like a book, or flat. Now, if that's my biggest problem of the day, I must be having a pretty good day. The reverse is a typical marketing mix of historical teaser, map info, components list, and play info. A few things jump out at me right away. One, the counters are Big. The 176 administrative counters are 5 eighths of an inch, but they are the small ones. Put your tweezers away, ladies and gentlemen. The 352 unit counters are cut to an impressive 13 sixteenths of an inch. For those of us who are not woodworkers, that's over three quarters of an inch. By the way, do you know the difference between a fine woodworker and a carpenter? Answer, about an eighth of an inch. Trust me, don't get me going on banjo jokes. Two, the map is big. The crowdfunding blur promised that the map would be 15 square feet. I crunched the math, and the two 31 by 40 inch maps come to a bit over 17 square feet. Promise fulfilled. Third, separate rules and scenario books with 13 scenarios included, nine that are playable on a single map and the rule book is described as insightful. I can hardly wait. Fourth, the player count is listed as two to four, which raises a flag in my mind regarding solitaire suitability. Note that the box does not have the usual complexity rating and solitaire rating used by most publishers. It is silent on the subject. Five, and my favorite, playing time is listed as one hour to three days. Yes, Brunhilde, you can now play Gettysburg in real time. I wonder if we can simulate meals, sleep, spousal honeydews into the three days, or is this a single sitting 72-hour marathon? And then you open the box, and right on top you are greeted by something special, an illustration and dedication to the late Rick Barber. Rick had been doing game illustrations for decades and developed a unique and instantly recognizable style of map art. All of the Blind Sword System games use his talent, and with a most fearful sacrifice, he has left us something special. Thank you, Rick, and Godspeed. So, let's take a look at the map. Oh my, here's another one. If you could get rid of the creases and hexes, you could hang it as a work of art. The barber touches everywhere, right down to the distinctive font used to identify the game and other locations on the map. Colors are natural and appropriate. Illustration is both attractive and functional. I can pick Rick's maps out of a stack of a hundred, and it would not even be hard. The usual bane of grand tactical maps, elevation, 
is handled with color gradations representing the ups and downs of the landscape. If color is not enough, Rick got out his calligraphy pen and subtly inked in the numeric elevations here and there. Unlike some of the earlier games in the Blind Sword system, the publisher did not do violence to the artwork by adding printed elevation numbers in white bubbles. Thank you, Flying Pig. Note to self, I don't think I have ever thanked a Flying Pig before. And then you realize something unexpected. This beautiful work of magnificence is a hard-mounted map. It is not paper. No plexi required. Now, I thought I had read the pre-sale marketing material closely, and I do not remember any mention of the map being mounted. Even the info on the back of the box makes no mention of the map being mounted. The only mounted map in all of gaming that compares for its size is the map from the venerable The Longest Day from Avalon Hill. And in one astonishing final surprise, the map lays dead flat when you open it on the tabletop. No adjusting or backbending, no laying on weights overnight, it just lays flat. Wow. Bottom line, you will like staring at this map for 72 hours, if you can stay awake, that is. The counters are all well done and physically are a significant upgrade to those provided by Tiny Games in The Devil's to Pay. The large unit counters are uncluttered and eminently playable. To those who grew up with the likes of Terrible Swift Sword, the complete absence of strength markers is shocking. What? No towers at half-inch counters all bucked up against each other? No dread of a hand twitch sending chits all over the map? No tweezers! Is it possible? Yes, Brunhilde, in this, our brave new world, it is. As with its predecessors, A Most Fearful Sacrifice uses more of a morale-based system rather than a headcount system to represent combat power. Units degrade by being shaken, being forced to skedaddle and rout. Being pressed too hard, units flip over to their battle-worn side with reduced strength. Eventually, Brigades reduce by losing counters, almost like a unit losing a stand in a miniatures game. Breaking with every grand tactical Gettysburg treatment I am aware of, the system is neither regimental or brigade-based. Instead, combat units are demi-brigades, where, for instance, the five regiments of Solomon Meredith's Iron Brigade are represented by two counters. Personally, I like the demi-brigade level of representation. As an intelligent compromise between regiment and brigade, I hope to see more of this in the future. While leader influence permeates gameplay, there are no actual leader counters in the game, and no low ammo counters, artillery rounds, pin markers, and much of the other administrivia found in older designs. While there is unit stacking, I expect the game will present a less cluttered play experience than we have seen from similar games in the past. The game uses a similar turn mechanic as the regimental Blind Swords games, but with a twist. The chit pull mechanic is replaced with a card pull. As Lutman describes in his game notes, cards can carry far more information than a mere chit, to the extent they can replace charts and reduce rule lookups, keeping players in the game rather than in the rules. At the beginning of each turn, players select and shuffle two of an assortment of key events they control into their deck of leader activations. The Confederate States and the U.S. decks are combined and shuffled, forming the draw deck for the turn. Daylight turns are hourly rather than the 15 or 20 minutes similar games have used. Players alternate being the designated card puller for the turn. If the card belonging to an opponent is drawn, it is given to them because some of the events that are drawn may be retained by their owner for later use, some of the events will be known to the opponent, and some will not. It just depends on which player was drawing the cards that turn the event was drawn. Yes, there will be a small impact on solitaire play, but this is nothing new. The same issue was in all the previous games of the system, and I never thought it was a big deal. Leader activation cards are the driving force behind the system. Activation by core instead of division is one of the key design elements Lutman makes to upscale the game to reasonably handling larger battles. That being said, 
Just because a core becomes active does not mean all divisions in that core can do whatever they want. Oh no, you don't get off that easy. You see, in addition to creating their activation deck at the start of each turn, players assign divisions an activation priority within their assigned core. Players express priority simply and efficiently by assigning divisional cards to their core's relevant priority slot on their respective army's command display. When a core activation is pulled, a die roll is made using a more detailed activation table printed on the card. The readout from the table will determine which division, or set of divisions, actually activate according to the priority assigned to them by the player at the start of the turn. Sometimes, a secondary roll will be made on a similar table on the just activated divisions card, providing even finer granularity. Upon activation, a general order is assigned for the formation, such as attack or defend. Orders determine what the unit can and cannot do for movement, fire, and assault. For example, units cannot move adjacent to an enemy unless under an attack order. By contrast, attacking units may not recover morale like a defending unit can. At times, choosing a formation order can be difficult. Subordinate units may not benefit equally from any given order. But hard choices must be made. Combat is similar, if somewhat simpler, than the regimental blind sword games. But combat results remain morale-centric rather than focused on tallying headcount losses. Anyone familiar with the earlier games will feel at home with this revised system. The cards themselves are of high quality textured material and beautifully printed. My cards showed a tendency to bow, but I think sleeving in normal use will straighten this out. And one of the stretch goals added five Stonewall activation cards that are available for alternate history lovers. The 32 page rule book contains about 24 pages of rules. I would put the complexity at about six on the nine point GMT scale. The rules are presented in a neat two-column format with font size maybe one notch smaller than my personal preference, but I think most readers will find it just fine. The rules contain a number of illustrations sprinkled throughout as well as shaded pop-up boxes to bring the reader's attention to design issues or subtle differences between the blind sword system or the devils to pay. The remainder of the pages contain the designer's notes. I always read those first and an extended example of play. And thankfully, the rear cover is filled with a detailed index. Yes! The standard book provides all the information needed for each of the 13 scenarios, beginning with the slaughter pen, a learning scenario with Hood's division attacking the round tops on July 2nd. The very first line in each scenario description indicates the scenario size, which I think will quickly and efficiently help many players. Lemon includes a tip of the hat to his prior work by entitling Buford's defense on July 1st as The Devil's to Pay, and his pick a charge scenario as In Magnificent Style. AMFS is a big game with a big footprint. Players with less time and space will still find plenty to do. Player aids are plentiful and of good quality. However, and this is the only significant negative criticism I have on the game, many of the important player aids are cramming too much information on the sheet and reducing the font way too much for comfortable viewing over many hours. The CRT sheet is a good example. The regimental games using blind swords separate fire combat information from the assault combat tables. As a result, the actual CRT has room to show even more detailed information in a highly reasonable format. Not so here. The terrain effects chart is no different, except that there is even less reason to scrunch stuff so much. You won't need tweezers to play this game, but you might need a magnifying glass. My guess is that there will be individuals working on replacement charts uploading to Board Game Geek shortly. If not, I may fire up Inkscape and do some work myself. So many things have been done right in this game that the community will take matters into their own hands if needs be. Having said that, I simply cannot end this conversation on a negative note. 
A most fearful sacrifice is my hands-down personal most anticipated game of 2022. No close second. And despite my high expectations, what I have seen so far fulfills and in places exceeds them. I can't wait to punch the counters out and get it on the table for real. So that's about it at the overview level. More than an unboxing and less than a full review, I'm trying to give you guys some timely, meaningful commentary that will give you a decent feel for the game while you can still get a copy from the publisher. Let me know if you like this approach. And if you could, please help the channel and yourself by hitting the subscription button. I have much more in the works, and you can keep close tabs on it by being informed. And please share your comments. Above all, this channel is for you, and I value what you have to say. I read all your comments, and I respond to most. Thank you for watching, and you all have yourself a pleasant evening.